Anna Kwan. My name is Anna Kwan. I live in Nova Scotia and I love going to the Halifax Public Gardens. It's a peaceful oasis in the middle of the city. I'm a mixed race, middle-aged, mad artist and maker of messes. I'm a poet and a novelist and I write sometimes for other projects like I'm doing a one woman show on Zoom, so a script. I also uh, make small animated films of my poetry and do whatever um, strikes my fancy at the moment. The Public Gardens is one of my favorite places to come almost every day. It's beautiful. There's something blooming newly, something dying, and every day is different. I come in the early spring to see the tulips, and even before that, I think there's some azaleas blooming. And then there's magnolia, daffodils, now there's pansies, and then the rhododendrons are spectacular later in the season. I'm a mad person and artist, meaning I have a psychiatric history. Sometimes I think of myself as psychiatrized rather than mad, meaning I've been slotted into the psychiatric system and interacted with it sort of like a piece of a machine or of a circuit board. I don't always feel positively about being mad, but it's part of my experience. I would not be me or have had the opportunities or some of the dear friends I've had without it. As a mad artist, madness has been my inspiration, content and context. This is a poem called Throat from my chapbook called Body Parts. Throat. There are scars from when I cut myself, not deep, fine like cracks on the screen of my cell phone. I know the hairdresser sees them and has been trained not to ask. I prefer it that way, of course, but I will tell you. They mean I hurt once and tried to hurt less. I failed at the time, but now they are surface only. A kind nurse tried to salve them away and left a fine tracer of cracks, not filled with gold, but new skin. The mind wants destruction, glorification, illumination, but the body accepts itself with a gentle infilling, making hills from furrows, a wave under skin always cresting. I live in a condo in downtown Halifax. Usually I like to paint indoors, but it's such a beautiful day, I decided to take my painting stuff outside. I like making art that's accessible, that people can appreciate and understand. I admit I like people to, to get it um, and to when they hear it, to have a gasp of recognition and, and think that's true or that's real. I like that. I may have said art saved my life, but I realized that isn't true. Art has saved my mind during COVID, but what saved my life all the times I was depressed and psychotic to the point of suicidality was fear first and hope after that. Fear of the pain of dying and what would happen after I died and hope that tiny firefly buzzing around in the distance that told me to hang on until the meds kicked in. Yes, meds, meds saved me too, but art, Making it and having made it makes life worth living. Today I'll be painting a self-portrait, which I call an unportrait because it's not a realistic portrait of myself. 
and it's going to be painted using primary colors, mostly yellow, red, blue, and maybe a little gold and silver if I get fancy. I'll be mixing colors as well, so there'll be a lot of yellow, a lot of green, a lot of orange. I'll be using the painting of myself as a background for an animation. It will involve using the painting and maybe collage and Photoshop and different things. I haven't quite figured it out yet. When I'm painting, I am often using quite an intuitive process. So sometimes if the project requires it, I have to draw out the composition first with a pencil, but usually I just start painting from an image I have in my mind. So my use of color is pretty intuitive and fairly spontaneous. And in the end, there'll be elements that I haven't imagined at the beginning. I tend to make art that's brightly colored and pretty big. I like making art on a large scale because I'm a big person and I like to put my whole body into making art. It makes me feel physically freer in ways that maybe I find difficult in everyday life because of certain challenges. For me, visual art has been the way to be happy and free and playful but you can do and still be serious about something. I admit I like playing with materials and words and colors. I like to have fun. When it's not fun is when I'm cleaning up after myself, revising my writing or proofreading. Painting especially is a place where I try not to worry, but to make something out of nothing, to be spontaneous and to make the most of my mistakes. It's a little like volunteering in that what you can offer, however small, has positive value. Anything I do when painting can be something. It can be a lesson to myself in what not to do, or it can be a thing that I make beautiful in spite of itself. It can be something too that if I don't like it, I can repaint over it and cut it up for collage. I drew a lot as a kid and read voraciously. The first book I remember loving was The Color Kittens by Margaret Wise Brown, about cats mixing colors trying to make green paint. I loved what seemed to me the dreamlike illustrations of the cats. I remember the muted colors, the fluid lines of paint spilling together. I have a memory of lying on my stomach on my bedroom floor, reading this book at the age of maybe three or four. That was the position I took on all through my childhood, reading in bed while lying on my stomach, drawing and studying. So this painting is sort of a cross between what I call an innie and an outie, like as in the belly button. <laughs> an innie is a portrait of an inner self. An outie would be a portrait that's more the representation of one's outer self, physical self. So usually I do more innies, but this one's kind of a hybrid between innie and Audi. What will be innie about this painting is I'll add elements that are meaningful to me that aren't physically here. Like I might put a tattoo on my cheek or I might add dragons or something, dragonflies on my shoulder. Not sure what I'm going to do. So just elements that represent something about me. So um, I've done all I can do on this painting for now. Uh, in a little while, a few days or a week, I'll add more um, color, more elements to the composition, like maybe some flowers and stars or whatever I want in the background and give myself more of a double chin to make it more realistic. Um, but for now, it's, it's, it's going to dry and I'm going to clean up. This self-portrait makes me laugh because it doesn't show my double chins. <laughs> I'm Anna Kwan. I'll be back after the break.
านาคอนไอ้เป็นสภาพการณ์ตลอดช่วงโควิดไอ้เรียนชอบดูการเห็นแมวดักส์และดูการเลี้ยงลูกสาวไปทางพื้นที่ในสวนสัตว์และหาอาหารทุกปีเขาแสดงความฝันแห่งชีวิตแบบใหม่ฉันก็เป็นสัญญาณที่ดีสำหรับฉันนิ้วไม่ต้องขึ้นบนต้นไม้หรือบนในฝีมือเขาจะร้องไห้ฉันก็จะร้องไห้ฉันก็จะร้องไห้ฉันก็จะร้องไห้ฉันก็จะร้องไห้ฉันก็จะร้องไห้ฉันก็จะร้องไห้ Replacing them will not go fast. In fact, I really must have you know, new needs are rather slow to grow. You'll be gone before they sprout. The rest of you will have given out. I started writing poetry in elementary school. When I was six years old, I wrote a little story for the Mimeograph School newspaper, and I dreamed of doing more of that. That was back when I was a gregarious, confident, happy kid before puberty and self-hate and depression and psychosis and the psychiatric system hit me. I grew up in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. I like to visit my dad in our old family home, where he and my mom raised my sister and brother and I. My dad has worked on every inch of this property. He often says, and can see himself everywhere in it. My mom lives in Vancouver Island now. I grew up in a house full of the news on CBC Radio, classical music and books, novels and poetry, non-fiction, popular science and art books. My dad was born in China and educated in. Alberta and England. My mom was born in Yorkshire, England, and got her high school equivalency in Canada, and went on to become a massage therapist after my parents split when I was 22. You were looking at this, Dad, and um, this is I mean, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of an accordion book of poetry that I wrote with um, watercolor. Is it an assignment for an English course? It was. It was an assignment for yeah. an English course. Great eight. Yeah. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Well, yeah. I'm just, yeah. I've kept these old school assignments and art projects from as far back as elementary school. Your artistic ability and mum's artistic ability probably filtered down to us kids. Both my parents appreciated the arts. My dad was a theoretical physicist, and my mother a homemaker, but both of them dabbled in the arts. My mom was a potter, and my dad made prints and paintings. My dad paints all kinds of subjects, including the family home, animals, trees, flowers, and a self-portrait. My parents have always been supportive of my artistic efforts. This is another assignment I did. This one I did. I would. I had my first little mini meltdown. I think when I was in grade eight, and I would. I had to do this story and these illustrations. And I hadn't done it the night before, and I. I didn't go to school the next day, and I spent all day working on it. The day I was supposed to pass it in, and then the day later I brought it in. I remember that meltdown actually that I had mm. over mm. this, and that was a pretty. Scary thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Well, at that age, just. Uh, well, that was sort of. I mean, that shows me now that I had a mental illness even at that mm, time. Mm. Yeah, it was really silly. Grade, you know, to be that <laughs> yeah. upset in grade eight about yeah, it. No, that means mean, you're serious a lot. It, well, I was serious, but I was way too perfectionistic. Mm. I drew a lot in elementary school, but by high school, I wanted to be a writer. I didn't see how it would be possible to do it and support myself. Besides, all the great artists I knew about and tried to emulate were dead white men. Some had gone mad, even died by their own hands. I was afraid of madness and afraid of not being able to survive. I stopped reading around age sixteen. That's when depression hit me hard, and I couldn't seem to concentrate on reading a book length anything. 
books became dissatisfying. And I was so obsessed with my own misery that not much could shift it, not even stories. Poetry was easier to read because it was shorter and often reflective of feelings I could relate to, angst, loneliness, depression. I went to university to study English because I thought, what else could I do? After graduating from university, I worked as a daycare teacher for a bit, then went to what was then Czechoslovakia to teach English. It was a wonderful, terrible eight months, and I did create some art there, but when I got home to go to the art college, my depression flattened me. I quit and spiraled into psychosis, ending up in the NS hospital for the first time at the age of 22. 1991 was my first hospitalization in the Nova Scotia hospital. And that was the start of 10 years of hell in and out of hospital. After getting unwell, being admitted, stabilized, discharge on medication, going off medication, the cycle would repeat itself. A cycle familiar to many in the mental health system. I thought my problem was a purely spiritual one, which I could fix by right living and right thinking. But every time I went off my prescribed meds, it was just a matter of time before I deteriorated to the point of suicidality. I didn't know what would become of me. Most of my friends and acquaintances had gone on to professional careers or master's degrees or med school. This photo would have been when I was in the small options home too, I think, in my 20s. Yeah, but I'm not yeah. sure about that when it was. Yeah. My dad always supported me to do what I was interested in. So that's oh, my... Yeah. I remember when you were young, you, you went to be a psychologist. Did I? Time. Yeah. I mean, I remember wanting to be a journalist and to be a teacher. Yeah. And I don't remember wanting to be a psychologist. So, <clears throat> but that's interesting that you say that, yeah. considering oh, what's yeah. happened. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, considering I, you know, ended up being ha mentally unwell for so many years. Well, <clears throat> that's, that's uh, really miraculous, the way it turned out. Well, yeah. so far so good. We'll yeah. see what happens, yeah. right? Yeah. A writer is a person that writes, and it doesn't matter how successful you are, but I'm glad I've had some success because that's what I've always dreamed of. In my late 20s, fresh off a six-month stint in the mental hospital, I started volunteering for a national cross-disability magazine called Ability Network. I learned a lot of things at the magazine, made some dear friends, gained the confidence to launch my own freelance writing career a few years later, which is how I made my living enthusiastically in whole and in part for the next six or seven years. Today on Zoom, I'm going to be reading the script of my one woman show, You're Welcome, Surfing Open Mics While Mad, to my mentor, Charlie Petch, and the producer at the Bus Stop Theatre's Writer's Circle, Meg Hubley. Oh, this is the nerve-wracking part before people sign on. <coughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Meg. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming. So, um, hope you can help me <laughs> with it. Um, Okay, where is everybody? Did I get the time wrong? Maybe, but it's my time zone. It's my show. Oh yeah, it's a webinar, isn't it? Then I wouldn't see anyone else's faces, but they'd be here. I'm in the wrong meeting, Frig. I got a Bus Stop Theater Micro Equity Grant to write this one act play, which is set on Zoom and will be performed over Zoom. Mental hospital mad, not angry mad, though sometimes I'm both. It's nothing to worry about. I just wanted you to know who's talking to you. Actually, a better description is fat-sized 
racialized, psychiatrized, and incompletely radicalized. I like to rhyme sometimes because, you know, I write poetry and I get tired of the same old labels, even the ones I've made for myself. I have my skirt. Check. It's on backwards because I got spaghetti sauce down the front of it, but who's going to know? I hope that today Charlie and Meg will give me some helpful feedback on where the Zoom script is engaging and where it isn't engaging. So where it lags or drags and maybe what I can do to change it. So then I just go into the open mic. <laughs> so, huh. I'd like to say I really enjoy where it's going. And mm-hmm. I love that it turned into an open mic at the end. That's a perfect mm-hmm. art. I, I feel really good, like, like going through the whole journey. And just, like, mm-hmm. I feel very uh, moved. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. And work. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And, um, Oh, keep in touch, and I really do appreciate you. you. Made me feel a little more confident about it, so I do appreciate that. Every reason to be, every oh, reason thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just blowing smoke up your ass there, and I <laughs> enjoyed the show. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. See you later. Thanks. Bye. 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 Enjoy your day. Bye. Okay. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> that is over. Ah, okay. I thought the feedback was really helpful and it boosted my confidence, but also um, there were some, it pinpointed some places where I could make things stronger more from the performance aspect than the writing aspect. Although Charlie did point out some writing things as well, but generally I felt really good about it. Yeah. I'm Anna Kwan. I'll be back after the break. Anna Kwan. In my 30s, I started taking medication regularly, and that helped a lot. At the same time, I started writing poetry again and self-published a few little poetry chapbook scenes. So I'd managed to become a writer. Then I thought, I might as well try writing the novel I always wanted to write since I was a kid, because what did I have to lose? My novel, Migration Songs, was published in 2009 by Invisible Publishing. It was so exciting for me to hold that book in my hands, and such a relief. This is an excerpt from my first novel, Migration Songs. It's about Joan, who's the main character and who's five years old here, um, and her friend Edna. There was a bird singing in the pear tree, lost somewhere among the blossoms. I imagined the pear tree as a beautiful cage and the bird as a captive, trying to sing its way out. If only it found the right notes, a door would magically open and the bird would be free but it sang the same lovely plaintive notes over and over again. Then when it did not receive an answer, it flew off. I'd written a book that drew from my story of being a half Chinese, half English Canadian girl growing up in Dartmouth and was about as writerly as I could make it. Before I published Migration Songs, I won an Inspiring Lives Award from the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia and was contracted to facilitate a writing group at the Healthy Minds Cooperative. That was the start of something beautiful. And I run it um, almost continually since 2007, except when I was unwell or away. It showed me I can contribute to the world in another way through my writing. I'm not a teacher, but a facilitator of writing experiences. Facilitating the Healthy Minds Writing Group is beautiful to me because some of my dearest friends are connected to me through writing, and that means a lot to me. We share writing and we share creativity experiences and we share a love of poetry and prose 
And it's beautiful for me to connect with people who do. Funny to think about how my madness could be a factor in my favor. It's definitely given me some interesting opportunities I would not have had or thought to seek out otherwise, like volunteering for Ability Network magazine and facilitating the HMC Writers Group. My next book was set in the Nova Scotia hospital. The protagonist was also half Chinese and half Caucasian, Slovak actually, and a little younger than I had been when I first landed in the NS. I wanted to give people a feel for the place, which I often called my home away from home, for the weirdness and the humanness of the place and for what goes on inside the mind of someone in the hospital and the kind of friendships that can form there. Lo was always the story I wanted to write, but I had to write another story first because I wanted to be seen as a writer first and not as a mad artist first. I didn't want my madness to be a factor either for or against me. This is a short excerpt from my second novel, Lo, when the main character, Adriana, is being taken to the Nova Scotia hospital by her dad. Mr. Song seemed strangely upbeat, and Adriana couldn't help but think how quickly his mood had changed. Maybe he was doing his best to put a brave face on, or more likely, he was simply relieved. Adriana looked at the pavement as they walked toward the hospital. At the front door, there was a rainbow of oil on the pavement, left by a car that must have sat there idling some time ago. It fanned out like the feathers of a peacock. For Adriana, it was a portent of some kind, as a rainbow always is, even such a rainbow as appeared in the oil leaked in a mental hospital parking lot. She could be admitted and stay there with the promise that something would resolve out of the oily blackness. She held on to that thought as her father pushed open the hospital doors. I started this painting a week ago outside and um, usually it takes me a couple tries to finish a painting. This self-portrait of, my, of myself, <laughs> self-portrait, my innie, will be used for an animation where I'll be using the painting as a background for the animation. Making art helps me feel like I'm seen in the world. It helps me say the things I want to say the way I want to say them. And enjoying art makes me see the world the way other people see it or want it to be. And that inspires me in so many ways. For me, making art is not therapeutic. It's just what I do and what I like to do and think has value in the world. But the materials and skills and techniques used to make art can be put to therapeutic uses and the parts of the human that make and enjoy art, mind, body, heart, soul, can find healing and satisfaction in those therapeutic uses. I've struggled with self-criticism and perfectionism, which someone said is the enemy of creativity, something I agree with, and which has harmed my mental well-being throughout my life. It's also limited my appreciation of a lot of the art the world has to offer and has hampered my own creative process. I'm more open and less rigid in my thinking now. Actually, I don't always try for perfectionism. I mean, some people will say, what is perfection anyway? But I think every work of art has its own logic and can probably be perfected in its own way. 
I take a photograph of my painting while I'm painting at different stages of the painting because I like to keep a record of what I've done and also because I find looking at the photograph gives me a different um, view of the painting and it's maybe more two-dimensional in the photograph so I feel like I'm seeing it the way another person would see the painting. So it helps me decide what colors to add and elements, and that kind of thing. I have added a lot of yellow to this painting, as well as white and lightened it up a little. I've added stars and swirls because I just wanted to capture kind of a sparkly moment when I was feeling happy. I'm Anna Kwan. I'll be back after the break. Anna Kwan. I used to paint on paper, but now I paint on canvas. Paper needs framing and it's too hard to transport. When I moved to Antigonish, I left a lot of my art in Halifax. I moved to Antigonish after a mental health breakdown because it was what kept me going during that breakdown, the idea that I would move to a small town. I stayed one and a half years. One thing I learned in Antigonish as an artist was some of the basics of editing film in Premiere Pro and how to make a digital story. So I've taken the film editing skills that I had um, from making my digital story there and used them to create animations of my own poetry. Polar bear. The dark is beautiful, milky, metallic. Heavy. Polar Bear is a film I made of my poem of the same name, which is a poem about climate grief. It describes a poet meeting up with a starving polar bear. He's a head by a body's length, his small head just above water, bony beneath the sleek fur. To make an animation, I use a lot of different kinds of images. Some are photos I've taken, some are illustrations that I find on the internet that are in the public domain. And some are images that I create myself in Photoshop. And then I collage them together in different ways and move them around and then edit them together in film editing software. My skin turns rosy and the water is on fire. I like animation because I deal in words and pictures and sound and movement, all those things from different disciplines in art that I enjoy. And I think they help to illuminate my poetry a little bit and they make it more accessible for some people who enjoy listening and watching videos as opposed to reading poetry in a, say, a book or a journal. When I'm making an animated film of my poetry, sometimes I start with an image that I like, that I've seen on the internet, that I've created beforehand. And that's the same way I actually write a poem. It might start with an image. So animation for me is a pretty organic process. I don't storyboard it usually. I just make it as I go. Arts brought me back to my happy, gregarious childhood self by helping me learn to play again and helping me feel free again. I don't think inspiration is overrated. I think it's necessary, but I think it can come from so many different places that aren't always acknowledged. So for example, I wrote a poem about changing a light bulb and it was a pretty good poem <laughs> as good as any I've written about flowers or spring or whatever I think so you can find inspiration in a lot of interesting places if you're looking if you're observing the world around you 
light bulb. I smelled something burning. Panic. Isn't my laptop? Chemicals scratch my throat. But nothing flames, nothing smokes. A pop and the light goes out. The metallic guts of a defunct bulb clenched in the socket of an old standing lamp. I unplug it, unscrew the bulb with an old towel. It's hot and let it rest on the bathroom sink. More like an old snake skin that the life's gone out of. A specimen, an exoskeleton of something that pulsed once, that sparked and sparkled. An electronic worm burrowing through the intestinal dark. What compels me to make something from nothing is partly I just like doing it. It's what I do for work. It's my profession in a way. And I think everybody likes to feel that they're contributing something to this world instead of taking something away. At least most people do. And I see that as my contribution. I'm a Baha'i and the arts and crafts have an honored place in my faith. Abdul Baha, one of the major figures of the faith, wrote, In this wonderful age, art is worship. The more thou strivest to perfect it, the closer wilt thou come to God. It's interesting that he doesn't say, the more perfect your art is, but the more you strive to perfect it, the closer you will come to God. The effort, the care, the attention, and whatever else goes into trying to perfect your art, the suffering sometimes, the better it will be for the artist spiritually. This is an interesting idea to me, and one that again speaks to the artist's process as being spiritually important and worth appreciating. Also, I think the seed of humility has been planted in these words. Perfection is unattainable using the material means and limited earthbound capacities that humans have available to them, but we can strive toward it nonetheless. Maybe there wouldn't be much need for art or for religion if that were not the case, if we were perfect, that is. My art is, it's a means to show myself to the world in ways that are not apparent just from looking at me. So, um, I mean, people have a lot of preconcept, conceived ideas about what it means to be a middle-aged, mixed-raced woman, to be psychiatrized. And I am not always what they think I am. So I like to put my art out there to say, well, I'm also this, or this is what I am. I'm Anna Kwan. I'll be back after the break. Writing is something that is both easy and hard for me, but it's what I do most naturally, I think, in the arts and also for a living. Some people say they write when they are inspired, but if I sat around and waited for inspiration, I'd never write a thing. When I was younger, especially in my teens, I had some moments of incandescent inspiration, but they were rare and burned out quickly. Now I never have them, but I write a lot more and more consistently, I think. It's my work. I like a deadline. I like time-limited projects. I like a goal. I take a memoir workshop called Making Our Voices Heard, Reimagining Mental Health Care. We write pieces of memoir in prose mostly and share them with each other using the her story method. And I'm combining some poems I previously wrote, which I'm calling Mad Woman poems, with the prose into a memoir that I hope will be a book-length manuscript. Writing my memoir of my madness is important to me for a number of reasons. One is that I've lived a long life and most of it I've been mad um, or had experience with the psychiatric system. 
I'm 52 now, and I want people to know what it was like to be going through the mental health system, say, 30 years ago. But also, I, I really want to remind myself of where I've been and what's inspired me to write what I've written and make what I've made as far as art goes. When I was younger, my mental health took up a lot of my energy and time and headspace, and I didn't have it in me to make art as much, even though I wanted to. A big part of my depression early on was not thinking I could be a writer or an artist or do anything with art that would help me survive in this world. And then I discovered I could actually make art and even make it a part of my life that helped me survive financially as well as emotionally and spiritually. So that was a great discovery. So I decided to make an animation using my self-portrait and the words, the end, because this documentary is about me and um, I thought it would be nice to have a little end, <laughs> end to the documentary, so to say goodbye to people. I used a photo of flowers from the public gardens to clip out the words, the end, from. So they're really pretty and pink, like the flowers were, and it shows up nicely against the black background at the end. I like to make things. I like the process, but I also like to feel I finished something, completed something, made a whole thing that stands on its own feet. Making art for me now is more of a joy and a pleasure, and... I'm not as perfectionistic about it, and I don't um, hinge my self-worth on it. So it makes it easier not to get depressed when things don't work out the way I want. Making art makes life worth living. For me, it's fun and beautiful and meaningful. For other people, I suppose it's playing hockey or helping others somehow. I think art helps others, though. I think it's another pair of glasses for people to look through and see the world in a different way. Writer Anna Kwan. Producer Rachel Bauer. Director Rachel Bauer. Director of Photography Scott Barrington. Editor Pamela Gallant. Online editor Brendan Wilson. Sound mix Reese Waters. Special thanks Charles Kwan, Pat Kwan, Sunya Kwan, Andrew Kwan, Meg Hubley, Charlie Petch, Sass Minard, Sheila Morrison, Uncommon Grounds, The Friends of the Public Gardens. Integrated Described Video Specialist Simone Cupid. Content Development Specialist Ryan Delahanti. Coordinating producer Jennifer Johnson. Director of production Karen I. Director of programming Brian Perdue. VP content development and programming John Melville. President and CEO David Arrington. Copyright 2021 Accessible Media Inc.